with this one. Okay, um, so I'm going to show you about um, a, a few, about five, four actually, um, zombie subdivisions that have come out of just the last few years uh, and the, this most recent recession. There's been quite a bit of quite a bit of work that's come as a result of uh, of uh, uh, the sort of rising out of the recession. Uh, but also, what's important is having some lifeblood to feed into. Uh, resurrecting these these other zombie subdivisions. So I'm starting off here with uh, Seabrook, Washington, which is by no means a zombie subdivision. Uh, it's a project I've been working on with, with uh, developer Casey Roloff uh, out in the Northwest um, for the last 10 to 12 years uh, since its origins. And this is the lifeblood that you have to be able to feed into. So in a way, the, the, the DNA that Michael was speaking about of much older uh, projects such as uh, uh, Lads Edition in Portland Seabrook, in a sense, has been that seed that has helped to, to now resurrect and, and bring forth um, a number of projects that, uh, uh, you know, that had previously come from other places. Um, Seabrook is... That's not advancing with that. Should you still hit the down arrow? I don't work with a Mac, so... All right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Seabrook is up on the Washington coast. It has, uh, you know, really a tremendous sense of place that we've been able to establish there uh, with very simple community gathering places. It's not a lot of infrastructure in terms of uh, civic amenities. There is a commercial mixed-use Main Street that we're developing there. Uh, we started off in the early years from 2004 when it first broke ground to around 2007 or 8 with really some significant houses, quite closely spaced uh, um, these were houses ranging from the, the, the mid 400s to up, uh, up to the seven and 800,000 range. Not affordable, unfortunately, um, uh, but it was really taking the, the rise of that period that we uh, all remember back in the, uh, around 07 to 08. Um, and with very, these very limited simple amenities of uh, park spaces and green streets, um, walking paths, you can see on the bottom right-hand uh, side here, that were the beginning of some concepts of, of creating limited, um, uh, inexpensive infrastructure that was going to be eventually the sort of tools that we needed to use uh, for resurrecting some other subdivisions. Um, but then finally, around 2008, that's when the uh, you know, things hit the wall. And uh, we were able to morph, we were able to use an agile approach as neurobism is, is, is so good at doing, to be able to change the paradigm and the type of, and the, the format of development. So instead of the conventional 100 foot deep lot on an alley in the back and a street in the front, we started going to the cottage court concept, which is very prevalent in the Northwest. Uh, um, Russ Chapin, one of our friends, is, uh, has been a real harbinger of that uh, in the Northwest, in particular in the cottage company. So this was one of our first um, assemblages of one of these tight little knit group groupings of small cottages, little two bedroom cottages, no street in front, facing into an internal green, uh, alleyways on the backs, no garages. We we're able to really drop the prices down into the 200 range. And this is what it took for Seabrook to actually be able to survive and thrive throughout the recession. Um, it gained a great deal of notoriety as a result, uh, as not only being one that stayed alive, but was actually uh, doing quite well during those years. Uh, I took that on the road, in a sense, or rather, people started coming to me during that time. This is a very small project um, uh, called Camp Lake Willa in the Willapa Bay up on the Washington coast, not too far away from Seabrook. Uh, I was approached by a, by a landowner or a developer that had started a project on this beautiful piece of land surrounding a little lake out on a peninsula in the Willapa, Willapa Bay. Um, he had already built out part of his infrastructure, part of his street system. On the left side, you can see uh, the network of, of, of a loop, of, well, not even a loop, a street on the northern side of the lake and a street on the bottom side, cul-de-sacs on both ends. He, he had already built out the northern portion of that cul-de-sac. The bottom half of the site had not been developed at all um, when he approached me. Uh, the plan on the right is essentially, I, I would call it a Frankenstein's monster in a sense. I had uh, an organ, some organs and pieces of body that I had to knit together with some new pieces. But instead of adding too much more to the infrastructure, I said, stick with the infrastructure that you've got. 
which was a little piece of this, actually having to work with a couple of cul-de-sacs. I certainly didn't design those into it. Um, uh, and actually taking the bottom half of the site that had previously been planned out, as you can see with very large lots, these are about, I think there were 12, uh, uh, five, uh, I can't remember the 16,000 square foot lots, and dropping them down to about 5,000 square foot lots, concentrating the density, the, number, the unit count, all on the northern end of the site around the existing infrastructure. There's a, an important technique to work with, keeping the bottom half of the site uh, open as public space, common space, also very important, I've got to go back to that, very important is the frontage along the lake. On the left-hand plan, all of the, the sites were backed up to the lake, backed up to the, the natural amenity. What I uh, introduced to them was bringing on the right-hand side um, uh, the frontages along the lake all becoming public with public pathways. And then all the way back and even, even into the cul-de-sacs to essentially make like um, cottage closes or it's cottage like points. It's a civic edge. A fantastic site, that a project that uh, then in just the last year or so, uh, I brought Michael Mahaffey in to work with me along with this as well, because it had a great deal of entitlement issues that we had to deal with. And that's one of the fundamentals of, of uh, resurrecting a, a, a zombie subdivision. This was a, a real mess of um, 16 identical condominium buildings. You can see it on the upper right-hand corner. That was the one and only building. Thank God no more of them were built. But there were going to be 16 of these. Um, that amounted would have amounted to over 500 units of condos on this site. We literally call this, the, you know, the train wreck plan. Uh, tremendous amount of uh, of road infrastructure that had been built in. Uh, the upper road had all been had all been brought in from one end of the site to the other. Uh, the bottom road, fortunately, had not been built. And the, uh, the you'll be able to see in the upcoming plan the one building that was placed in. What we did was. Um, was to take those roads, we're going to cut away asphalt as part of the zombie uh, resurrection process, turning a 60-foot wide parking lot into more of a 28-foot to 26-foot wide uh, queuing street with on-street parking on both sides, uh, pulling away and removing asphalt, literally. You can see the one large building in the center of the site there. We're creating a, a commercial center off on the right-hand edge at the entrance. Um, that had not been there before. And there's a series of wetlands that are throughout the site that we've wrapped co uh, cottages around. Um, some of them, again, with, using that same methodology that we've been, I've been working with at Seabrook um, in the latter years of concentrating and reducing infrastructure, still maintaining a level of connectivity, however, um, that, of course, is a, an essential component of good numbers of projects. Most important, the bottom edge you'll see here has a lane that is running along what is the edge of a large and, and very beautiful National Wildlife Refuge. Um, has amazing snowy uh, owls that are, that are found in here each year, uh, leads down into uh, a beautiful waterway, and then eventually to the beach. And there are going to be trails that are going to run through that. So we use that frontage as an amenity. Michael likes to use the, call this uh, a civic edge. It's a concept that I've been uh, continually working with, and of course, many of us are, are working with where we face out to a public edge. We face out to the amenity of, of a natural system like this, natural amenity. Uh, getting into little the details, these are the first phases. We've designed the housing, a variety of very small, uh, simple, local, vernacularly based uh, housing design, uh, some uh, uh, townhouses and, and live work on the upper left-hand corner, and then a, a central court that would uh, orient then out to the green uh, of the nature preserve down to the south. Another project that actually I've been doing uh, over the last couple of years with uh, the developer of Seabrook, and um, uh, as well as Olivia Beach and Bella Beach that I worked with them on previously, now is out on the eastern edge of the Cascades. It's uh, Lake Chelan. It's a beautiful uh, lake out on the dry side of the, uh, of the Cascade Mountains, whereas the west side in Seattle and Portland were, is known for its rain. This is where it's sort of the high desert, warm and beautiful, and, and up in the mountains on this amazing lake of Lake Chelan. Um, you can see on the left-hand side the original uh, zombie that we were left with. Uh, my developer client had bought this property uh, with uh, much of the road infrastructure in this double donut loop thing that was, uh, you know, had previously been built out, and even about three or four houses had previously been built, sitting up on top of a hill overlooking the, overlooking the spectacular 
lake, and it's, a, and it's connected to and a part of the city of Chelan, which I don't have uh, uh, to show you, but it's off to the east here. Uh, what we did then was to, they also purchased an adjacent property that uh, was being used as a winery. As, and it had beautiful wine groves on some of the hillsides, but also an active uh, restaurant and wine center. That was um, incorporated then and knit and stitched together with the existing, uh, uh, what I call the double donut up, up on top, to create a full mixed-use neighborhood. Uh, you can see some of the details on the left-hand side. That's the first phase that we literally uh, cut in and search, sutured in uh, to, the, to the existing plan. Uh, some of the images of, uh, uh, of, of, you can see the beauty of this, of this natural setting overlooking the lake um, and some of the first houses that have been built there. Uh, finally, another project that I brought Michael on into, uh, we call this a green zombie because it was a project that had been going along for many years uh, with very high intentions by its developers and its property owners, but they weren't developers uh, per se. They were uh, lawyers and landowners that had been working with this land for quite some time, hired some of what they considered the best uh, uh, sustainably minded green oriented uh, planners and, and urban designers in Portland. Uh, but came up with what we thought was quite a, a, a problematic plan. Very dis dispersed and broken up uh, into different uh, pods of development without a street network, without a basic network. Yet they had a pedestrian and a biking network that they thought was uh, all that they needed. Uh, we retrofitted this by inserting into the center of it a green in land that was actually at, uh, at the point that we arrived there, uh, unbuilt lots. Uh, re redeveloped and re reoriented uh, some of the street system and the, and the pathway network. What I'm showing on the left-hand side is not Wilder. It is Olivia Beach, which is in the same town. Uh, another project that I did with the, uh, with the, uh, the developers of Seabrook. Uh, and we showed them this as the, uh, again, the DNA as to what they should be working with. Uh, and a lot of those elements we inserted into this plan, such as the central green um, pathways that are, uh, you know, beautiful boardwalks instead of uh, concrete sidewalks and vunerfs. Final project is Port Ludlow, uh, creating a main street. Uh, Port Ludlow is a, on a, one of the islands in the Puget Sound. Um, you can see in the upper left, upper right hand corner, uh, a defunct old 1960s shopping center. We all know about this, uh, this sort of work, but it's um, uh, once again creating a main street. Uh, working with the vernacular of the local region. Uh, this is something that's also moving forward. Uh, finally, I want to show you the transect of zombie, uh, zombie uh, developer types. Uh, I found this on the internet, so I didn't create all of this, but the, uh, I filled in with some of the, uh, uh, the background. It's essentially, essentially a transect of, uh, from crawler to shambler, walker, runner, and thriller. So the crawler is barely willing to rear their faces out of the mud to question, sprawl, and consider what lays ahead. They'll never catch up. The Shambler is curious why New Urban as a project seems to be selling well, seem to look so great, everyone loves them, but are likely to return to their old ways and tend to topple over uh, and fall uh, flat on their faces. Uh, the Walker is taking those first steps uh, to recognizing the value of walkable communities, but tend to miss lots of steps along the way. Uh, they're well-intentioned, uh, let's say this is the, the green zombie approach, uh, but still can result in lifeless places. The runner is so enthusiastic about walking, mixed, walking and mixed use that they embrace it so much as to sometimes smother it. Remember, walk, don't run. And finally, the thriller. They are thrilled to simply be involved in, in making a great place like this. Um, they, they study the practice of new paradigm of planning and development, leaving sprawl thinking behind, most likely to rise again. Uh, a few takeaway points. Build upon local examples of lively places. Consolidate lots around built infrastructure. Raise the value by preserving best natural amenities for the public. And break down development phasing into affordable increments. Create retail amenities to serve unmet existing demand. Use natural resources as amenities. Create new connections through pre-built streets and blocks. Assemble adjacent properties to build complete neighborhoods. Re return to the basic principles of good neighborhoods with essential centers and good edges. Retrofit 